I think that the number one analytic that anyone should ever be paying attention to, whether it was four years ago, today, or four years from now, is engagement. It literally shows who is paying attention to you, and therefore who cares about what you have to say. You know, everything else comes after that. If you're not going to grab people's time and attention in 2016 and moving forward, you're not going to touch their wallet. You know, you're not going to touch uh, anything. It be commerce. They're not going to go to a shopping cart. They're not going to walk into your store. They're not going to refer you to anyone. You know, and produce word of mouth. So if you're not engaging people, which I know sounds simple, but it's really not because, you know, people here and a lot of people around the world are complaining that, oh, you know, organic reach is dying and this, no, you're just not being engaging enough. You know, organic reach, yes, is plummeting because the social networks are leveraging, you know, their power to make you pay to, you know, reach more people, but organic reach is still well and alive. And we've seen it with the brands that we work with. When you put engaging content out there, people engage. And when you don't put engaging content out there, people don't engage. I think if um, quantitative analytics um, and engagement is the what, the qualitative is the why. So after we've looked at kind of the, the hard numbers, the bounce rates, the engagement rates, the next thing we want to look at is um, why things aren't performing well. And I think that um, looking at a set of content principles or content questions that you can ask and score content against is a really good way of understanding, okay, out of the 10 different dimensions that your content has, so the context, uh, the tone of voice, um, the visuals, um, how it responds on any device, um, you can start to understand where things are going wrong. Because I think when people think about the quality of content and content engagement, they think about how well it's written or how pretty it looks. And I think there's a lot of kind of hidden layers of UX and UI that, um, that go into creating a piece of content and looking at the qualitative aspects can help uncover some of the reasons why it might, might not be performing so well. We had a client, fortunately, who all he cared about was engagement. I wouldn't call it engagement at the time. It was that metric hadn't really been invented yet. But, um, but he wanted to know on a post-by-post -post basis what performed the best. Right, what got the most views, shares, comments, likes, whatever those things were. And more importantly, he wanted to know why. Right, and I remember our first, he came in after we had been managing the account for a year already, he came in and got his first report and he said, you're showing me how this is going, I don't care how it's going. I care about why, I want to know. And so, it really shifted our thinking and the conversation became, okay, you told me these things perform the best, you've told me you're best assumptions about why that's happening. Now let's see what you're going to do with that next month. And, and then the goal became to optimize and outperform the previous month by working on a set of assumptions about whether it was the time of day or the length or the color or these, all these different factors that can impact engagement. You know, definitely agree with everyone here, but I always encourage people to take a step back and just realize that we're all consumers, we're all human beings. And the human psyche often gets kind of lost or left out of the strategic thinking. Um, so yes, it's you know sort of zeros and ones, but you also just kind of have to take a look at it, even looking at a good um, amount of time, like a month, and just kind of going, okay, we've looked at the hard and fast numbers, and this is working and this is not working. But again, why or why isn't it? And you know, how are we um, connecting with that consumer in a way that's driving our end goal? Um, so you know, figure out what's working, what's not working, and also evaluate, like you were saying, Josh, what's going on in the world outside as well. Because something that works one month may not work the next month, and it has you have to be very sort of um, you know uh, reactive. Well, first of all, I thought you were going to take my answer because step back. So this is how I'm going to start my comments, but unfortunately, I have a different right. okay. thing. Well, my step back is, you know, speaking with both brands and agencies and influencers, is what are your objectives? There are thousands, if not millions, of things that you can measure, and you can, and if you could bog down in everything, what is the objective? Are you, are you, do you have a garden blog, and you want people, you want to get ten likes, or you want to really help people make better heirloom tomatoes, or are you a brand, a multi-million dollar company that wants to run a, a strategic social campaign? that is going to drive either leads, conversions, or sales. You know, and your metrics, you need to cater your metrics and all of your measurement to those specific needs, or otherwise you're just going to fail miserably, or just be kind of, you know, if, if, you're, if your goal is to drive sales, and okay, yes, we've got 12% more likes, okay. 
how does that relate to your end log goal? So define your objectives, define what you want to do, and then figure out which analytics and metrics are going to get you to that objective. So in summary, these are all amazing points. Define your objective, think about which analytics actually match to that objective. So does the thing you're measuring correlate to the end result? Uh, take a look and constantly look on why campaigns are performing, how you can improve them, what are the qualitative and quantitative metrics, um, what are people, why are people interacting with so They're humans, you know, if you write about too much like an ad, maybe that's a reason why it's not performing. So remember that these people are humans, but in summary, uh, align your metrics with the outcome, look at why it might be performing, uh, make sure that you're constantly looking back on how you can improve this and asking why this ad is performing the way it is. And remember that your audience is humans, and if you wouldn't interact with it, there's a good chance your audience wouldn't either. So I think that's a, a good summary of one. Anything else? I love what she said too about you know being a human. I think the biggest issue that marketers have today is that when you're marketing, you're wearing a marketing hat, and then when you leave work or when you leave your desk, you put on your consumer hat. And you see that across the board. And so my test for myself and for the clients that we work with is if you wouldn't share this on your own personal Facebook account, assuming you're the, you're the, the target customer, then don't share it on your business account. Now, if you're not the target customer, a lot of people say, well, you know, I work for Mazda, for instance, but I don't drive Mazdas, I drive something else. Well, then just go and actually talk to people who do drive Mazdas. Don't assume you think you know who they are because you've done these focus groups and you've done these, you know, very professional, formal ways of gathering information about your target audience. Go and actually have real conversations with real people who you know are in your target audience. Thinking about that, um, oftentimes people call it a consumer journey. I mean, it's, it's a human journey. It's, it's something we go through every day when we buy a pair of shoes or buy something on Amazon. What brought us to that buy spot? What brought us there? You know, um, is to evaluate your entire ecosystem. So not just social media. Look at your website, look at your purchasing model, look at whatever you own as a brand, as an influencer, look at that entire ecosystem and think about that journey. So from point A to point B. So if you're serving them a Facebook ad and then they go to your website and then they go to your shopping cart, think about is it hard, is it easy? Is it easy for them to do the thing that I want them to do? Do I find it frustrating? Is there a pop-up ad? Um, so really, you know, evaluate that entire ecosystem, that entire journey with the goal of driving, you know, to that final conversion or whatever that might be. Look at everything um, from point A to point B. Don't just think about your blog or your Facebook page. Think about the whole ecosystem. Yeah, so put yourself in the shoes of the consumer and evaluate the whole journey. You know, those are two things I, I think people don't do enough. They, they write the ad and they think, hmm, how can we tweak this ad to get better metrics? And they never think, like, let me consider that a user is going to have to start on Facebook and end up on the sale page. They never go through that process. And I think when you put yourself as a human and go through that, a lot of, uh, a lot of good, uh, good things come out of it. I'll give you one example on this front. Um, it's a great blog post if anyone wants me to send it to you, I can find it. But this, uh, this guy was mad at his roommate for not uh, cleaning the dishes. And so he used Facebook custom audiences to target one person, his roommate, and he had a picture of the actual kitchen, the dirty dishes, and he paid like, you know, some high CPM to make sure that his roommate saw it. And obviously, like, you'd think, oh, ads, they get 0.05% click through rate. Well, his roommate obviously clicked on that ad because it was like, hey, Joe, like, go clean the dishes. But if you can actually make your ad match, like, the consumer, Obviously, that's an extreme example, but like there was a hundred percent chance that his roommate clicked on the ad. If you can make your ad match the consumer, you can get a lot higher than that 0 0.05 percent. So I think these points about looking at the compute consumer journey, improving the metrics, and thinking you're human are, are absolutely critical. So let's move on. We've talked about some of the analytics. Now let's talk about some of the actual ways you can do that. I think we've been very broad with channels. But from your guys' experience, what channels are working the best? What channels are getting the best analytics? And if somebody's looking to run an ad, is it Facebook ads? Is it Facebook custom audiences? Where are people going today to get the best metrics? I think the newest channel always works the best. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, you see a depreciation in, in click-through rates as time goes on. So when display ads first came into existence, everyone was clicking on them because they were new and exciting. 
um, and you could get like a 3% click-through rate, which would be insane these days. Um, so I guess um, one, of, one of the latest things is content discovery, so things like Taboola and AppBrain. Um, so at least in the last year or so, uh, they've been seeing much higher click-through rates than, than other uh, parts of the page. Um, but I would say that that's probably depreciating pretty quickly, so... Well, I want to jump in there for a second and say that all of the, or not all of them, but a lot of the links that you see in Taboola and Outbrain are clickbait, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And so there's a reason that those links are getting clicked on, because they're outrageous or they're very eye-popping. The visuals are also very eye-popping. Um, I still think Facebook's the, you know, the 800 pound gorilla. I mean, I think the amount of consumer data that Facebook is sitting on, and, and I don't know how many people here, maybe just by a show of hands, like how many people have used Power Editor in Facebook? So, okay, only a few people. So, and these are the kinds of things, and also, you know, I work with um, some small business businesses as well on the consulting side, and I think there's just a lack of education mm -hmm. um, in, in basically understanding how powerful the Facebook advertising platform is, which obviously is not accessed by Instagram as well. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the things that you would be actually terrified if I told you some of the things mm -hmm. that you could do in terms of targeting and the detail and the extent to which Facebook just has so much consumer data, they will tell you, you know, bracket range of income, you know, household income, they'll tell you, you know, I mean, the things that you, that you know they know and then things that you would have no idea. And the reason that they're able to process this kind of information is because they have some kind of algorithm that's different from the newsfeed that literally is processing thousands or millions of words per minute or per second, whatever it is. And so the things that you're telling Facebook, not I'm in a relationship, not I live in Los Angeles, not I checked in here at Microsoft, but the things you're just typing in Messenger, for instance, or the things that you're just typing in a status, or the kinds of videos you're sharing, you have no idea the kind of processing systems that Facebook has. And so even though, you know, whether it's content discovery or Snapchat, when it's some of the newer things, I still think that the ability to target people on Facebook it still has the biggest audience and the most wide ranging audience. Snapchat might be the sexiest thing right now, and especially for the influencers, Instagram as well, but Facebook is still reaching the most amount of people, you know, in terms of age group, you know, socioeconomic levels, uh, you know, all different types of, you know, multicultural. So, I would, I would not overlook Facebook if I don't, which I think a lot of people are. Not necessarily in this room, but in general. Yeah, and I love so, your point about Power Editor, too. There's Facebook Power Editor just gives you so much control, much more than the one page, uh, you know, normal. Yeah. Both, of, both of the suggestions so far we apply, which is we rely heavily on Facebook for advertising. It's still our, by far our, our main advertising platform for our clients. But we also look at what's new within Facebook because their algorithm as best we understand it, favors the things that they're trying to roll out. So for the last six months of the year, it was, it was video, now it's live, right? So when you advertise, when you use their kind of new units that they're testing out, they give you a boost uh, against the algorithm, and that's, that's really helped us. And so that, but that changes every six months or whatever, right, as they roll out new features. Facebook is, it, it is, it's, the, 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 it, it's huge, you know, and that they're constantly changing and evolving and there's so many opportunities and the thing that, you know, when I consult with my clients, I say Facebook, it's going to be cheaper and you're going to be able to hyper-target to know to more than any other platform. Um, uh, so, you know, there's a lot of tools and resources on there for you guys as influencers or small business owners. There's tons of informational video. I, I still to this day think Facebook does the best job of, of assisting people. Um, you know, and, and the, I always say like go onto their platform. They have so, so much information to look at what Power Editor is and videos and things like that, what business pages are. Um, it's all on there. The tools and resources are there, which is really great. Um, when it comes to where to spend your time and your money, um, it just depends. It depends on the audience. You know, I have a lot of clients that are mom focused or parent focused. And yes, the advertising is, in, in one aspect, the, the um, cost per lead is cheaper on Facebook, but um, awareness is cheaper on Pinterest because Pinterest has such a mom-focused audience. It's also where a lot of um, sort of moms are, are, are key moments, things like pregnancy, marriage, weddings, um, Pinterest is the place for that. So I know that I can provide um, content like infographics and things like that and have more of an engaging interaction with a, a mom on Facebook than I, or rather on Pinterest. 
Um, you know, but I also know maybe I'm marketing a product that is um, braces, and I need our Invisalign is one of my clients, and so you know, wanting to get the teen interested in Invisalign to go to mom to ask and say I want Invisalign instead of braces. I had two consumers I had to target, so I was looking at Snapchat and I was looking at Pinterest and I was looking at Facebook because actually moms and, and teens are on Facebook. Teens might not do as much on Facebook, but they're still on there. So again, that's just a prime example of you know goal and objective is to get moms and teens to both buy into this product. Um, strategy is to look at different platforms and, and then obviously based on those platforms, I'm gonna measure differently. Facebook, I'm gonna see a lower conversion rate, so it's not gonna cost me as much to get a mom interested and to actually go into the dentist's office. But on Pinterest, I'm trying to engage with her during a lifetime moment, which is back to school. I gotta think about getting my kid in braces. So again, that's just the sort of a, an example of where, you know, the pros and cons for each of those platforms, but it all relates back to the end goal and objective and how I'm gonna measure that. And, and I wasn't laughing at, I was laughing at the teens on Facebook because there's a, a recent article, I think it might have been Tube Filter, saying that the olds are coming to Snapchat, <laughs> meaning like 24 and over. Yeah. So it's a new demo, 24 and over, the olds are coming. Yeah. But yeah, definitely define your objective. The uh, creative should be pertained to that platform specific. Yeah. Um, so you know, kind of what comes first, the chicken or the egg, but certainly you're going to have, have something if you're doing a, a Twitter campaign or a Twitter creative versus Facebook creative versus Snapchat, et cetera, et cetera. Really defining your goals, what works, and then um, and, and trying to, once again, is it a branding comp? Is it, is it a front of mind? You know, social media is basically a conversation. So what do you, what's the end result of the conversation? Is it casual entertainment? Are you giving someone value with the information you're sharing with them? Or you're literally trying to generate some type of conversion or a or a revenue generation. And it's really there's so many different scenarios. You know what do you want to do and, and just having that plan ahead of time. Yeah. yeah. So I think these are also really good points. I think generating a conversation is a point that's uh, that's overlooked a lot. You know, a lot of marketers come from the display ad, TV commercial days, and they really don't realize that social media ads don't quite work the same way. You might get engagement, but... And it's, and it's keeping the conversation going. Right. You may design a fantastic photo shoot with a lipstick, with a great story being told by everyone around it, but if you post that, and then you leave it, and then people are making comments, or, oh, I don't like that, or where can I get that, and you're not engaging, re-engaging them, or keeping that conversation going, or having the next post plan to um, optimize that, you're, you're losing. It's not, a, it's not an on and off switch. It's, a, it's an ongoing effort that needs to be continually managed and, and optimized. I think that's a really, really good point. Good. I think that's also one of the, the weak points, generally, in the content development process, is the breakdown between content delivery and then that feedback through analytics and measurement back into optimization. Um, and in my previous um, role, agency side, it was one of the things we saw again and again, is that there's that campaign mindset, um, especially in ad agencies, where you do one campaign that ends and you move on to the next one. Um, and content especially is very much always on and you're looking to kind of feed back everything that you've learned from the last post, the last campaign, back into what you're doing next. So I think optimization is a really important part of the measurement. I was at an agency and I was, you know, we were sort of pitching projects and um, it was a web-based product, you know, web website and it was a mobile app that was going to have a video concept and um, you know, I was like, I need to sit at the table. And they were like, well, why do you need to sit at the table? And I said, because I'm listening to the consumers on social so I can tell them what kind of video content they would be interested in and vice versa, you know? So it shouldn't be, you know, one thing shouldn't inform the other. It should all be looked at holistically. Yeah, that's a great point. It yeah. reminds me of one of my clients, uh, one of the biggest restaurants here in LA. Um, they get tons of reviews on Yelp, just tons. And I think there's still a big disconnect. I mean, Yelp, by the way, social media, it's, yep. you know, it's, a, it's not just Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, it's basically any two-way conversation that you can have with people on the internet. So Yelp, TripAdvisor, et cetera. So, you know, there's still a big disconnect between like even marketing as a whole and the rest of the organization, let alone social media disconnect, marketing disconnect the rest of the organization. I think the most uh, successful organizations, whether it's a small business, you know, an enterprise brand, has a streamlined approach 
to being able to take feedback from any channel and then being able to provide that feedback to the right departments so that you can integrate that into whether it's product development, whether it's customer service, whatever it may be. But the example I wanted to share was that we had a situation on Yelp where we had three reviews from three different people. They have a few restaurants at one of the restaurants within one week. And every review said, the woman at the bar in the morning doesn't get good service that, to that extent. Well, we know that there's one woman who works at the bar every morning. So by being able to not only check Yelp and have that two-way conversation, but then take that information and direct it to the correct manager who could then nip it in the butt, actually saved a bigger situation from happening. Saved money, saved you know, headaches, saved you know, increased customer lifetime value because now you're going and addressing that and she's able to understand, well, you're not doing a good enough job, so you're gonna make future customers happy who sit in that area. And those are the kinds of things, that's a very simple example. But if you're not utilizing the unprecedented tools of social media to interact and engage, not just by putting out content, that's the first step of many, but then to listen, uh, not just you know, uh, quantitatively, but qualitatively to what people are saying, if you don't have the protocols and the systems in place to be able to take that feedback and implement it in the areas that make the most sense so that you're actually improving your business and making more money and getting more customers and extending the lifetime customer value of your existing customers, None of this even matters. Yeah, that's all very valuable, actionable information where back in the day you would have a focus group and pay thousands and thousands of dollars or do a reader survey. Now you have real time information on how to do exactly what you said or how to improve anything or maybe it's on a meal or anything like that. So I think it's a great point. Yeah, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, you, know, you don't have to have a huge budget to do social listening. Um, I did social listening before the Radiant Sixes of the world came around, and I did social analytics back when it was literally me looking at um, websites and how many shares they had and tracking an Excel document and using interns. <laughs> I mean, this was before social listening was even around. So it can be done, you know, again, kind of leading back to the whole concept of its human psyche is to, you know, go and, and explore, you know, look at what people are saying, you know, if you're um, a particular, you know, brand or a particular influencer, look at your competitors out there. What are your competitors doing? What are people like you doing? What What's working? What's not working? And you don't have to have an, you know, expensive social listening system. I mean, obviously they have um, more information they can provide, but I just go online. I do Instagram searches. I do Twitter searches. I'll look at hashtags. Like I just kind of go down the rabbit hole of kind of exploring what's out there. So it's definitely at your fingertips. Yeah, I think this is a good transition, uh, just into just keeping you going to hit all the topics, um, into tools, tools for analytics, tools to actually achieve some of this stuff. You know, on social listening, I think I, I think that's a really good point. Like I use Mention.com, it's like ninety bucks a month or something like that. It works for loads of keywords, and it searches like Reddit and Pinterest and Quora and everything. And Google Alerts is free. Like these tools, you know, have huge value for like dollars. But what else is out there? What tools do you guys recommend for analytics, for social listening, for running campaigns, for creating better content? What's out there? Hootsuite. Yeah. Okay. I think that's, that's it. That's really the only thing. That's the only company doing it right now. They're pretty much the vanguard in the uh, entire industry and in the market. We actually do use Hootsuite. We love it. What do you love about it? Uh, well, I'm, so I'm not the social manager for any of what we do, so I actually don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. But I know that my team in our calls talk, I mean, they, they use it. I assume that it's easy and fast, and that's, you know, my team's managing a lot of brands at one time, so uh, those, those are the things that would probably matter to them. Um, and we also use a lot of the just direct, you know, Facebook Insights is incredibly valuable to us. We use some other listening tools, Social Bakers, Sprout Social, mm -hmm. Um, some of that is, is, you know, each of our clients has different services they've signed up for, but, um, but you know, getting direct insights from the platform is, not, is obviously really valuable as well. I think uh, on the Hootsuite perspective, and I'm sure there's plenty of other tools that can do this too, but Boolean uh, queries can get you a long way, um, and they're a really great way of kind of doing it the analysis at the beginning of the process, so competitor analysis, understanding what your customers are talking about, either directly to you or about you, because a lot of the brand conversation isn't happening with you, it's happening with other people. 
and you need to make sure that you're you're listening to those conversations and then again at the end so see what what went well what went wrong what are they saying about you after the campaign so making sure that analysis process happens at the beginning and the end um, and other tools I've used, um, I started out in SEO, so looking at um, backlinks and references because I think that SEO and social are, are very interlinked and intertwined. So looking at all of the mentions of your brand or a particular page on your website um, across the internet, there's loads of tools um, out there uh, like search metrics that can, that can help you look at your backlink profile as well. Yeah, there's there there is a, a number of and it, once again it's what are you trying to measure? You know, are you an influencer? Or are you a brand? There, there's there's so many tools. There's you know there's Domo, there's DG, there's Epoxy. Um, Hootsuite has uh, uh, even you have some free options that you do, and they have options where you're talking about the social measuring where something's peaking throughout the thing. Um, it's what you need. Google Analytics is great as well. I mean, it's the, kind of the go-to starting place. But it's putting those analytics in a workable, actionable um, dashboard so that you can achieve whatever those objectives are that we talked about before. Whether you want to have more, you want to, you want to get a million subscribers, whether your engagement rate is horrible, whether your brand and you know you, you want to, I don't know, launch a, uh, a new platform. It's just depending on, on, on what your goals are. They're all out there. There's a lot of really good ones. And it's, it's finding the ones that work for you, just like a tool or a shoe, what feels comfortable and what makes you achieve your goals. I was going to say, a lot of times people also offer free trials or short-term trials or things like that. So, um, you know, I definitely recommend get on the phone with a representative, like let them sell you the product or try it out. And if it doesn't work, you know, most of these things are monthly subscription type um, system. Um, take the tutorials. Um, you know, you, it's, it's not a... Um, it's not like a magic wand that you wave and it does it all for you. It's meant to be an assist. Um, so even with the large things like Radiant Sex, you still have to put in the right search queries and the right search terms. Um, so there's still work that has to go into it. So, you know, especially in the world of analytics, it can be extremely overwhelming. I, I, I'm not a good search term query person. I can't write that, but I had a great analytics team that could. Um, so maybe if I'm, you know, sort of by myself, something like a Radiant 6 isn't going to make sense because I don't have the right resources. Um, there's also, I would say, too, like Hootsuite is a prime example of, of a platform that does multiple things. It's community management, it's content management, it's analytics. So also when you're looking for those tools and resources, think about not just the singular thing that it does, but maybe the multiple levels of things that it does. I, I, I think, think it, go ahead. I think you can also be really creative with how you're using analytics. So one uh, one thing I did a couple of years ago with a tea brand was actually um, to understand how people talked about um, tea at breakfast time. We just went on Instagram and pulled off every photo that had a mention of tea. Um, and I think we were looking at strong tea in particular. And we found, just looking through people's images, um, that they associated strong tea with um, like uh, English breakfasts and setting up for the day and like getting ready for that meeting. Whereas other types of tea, like herbal tea, was more about avocados and watermelon and grapefruit, <laughs> which was really interesting. And that's in insight we would never have gotten from search because people are just not talking to tea in that way to their friends or on um, on search queries. So yeah, that was a really creative way of looking at. I, mean, I think that brings up a really interesting point, which is um, most endeavors just don't get specific enough, right? And so, you know, I think pretty, you know, most of the tea world is sort of looking for tea, right? Like in, 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 in the, on the marketing side, right? They want to know who. So to get into more specifically strong tea versus herbal tea, you know, I'll, I'll give you my example. So I mentioned I'm a podcaster and I talked to musicians in a lot of cases, but we're talking about business and entrepreneurship, right? So we do a lot of searches. We want to see who's talking about, who are fans of those musicians, but most of the people that are fans aren't going to care about a business podcast, right? That's just, they want to know when the new record's dropping, when the show's coming. So to just find fans of our guests is really pretty much irrelevant, right? We've got to dig a couple of layers deeper into people that are also interested in entrepreneurship and business and startups and all these other topics that we get into. And so I think there's always the opportunity to challenge ourselves to just keep going deeper.
Yeah, that's a, I, I love that point. Like, keep going deeper, keep getting more insights. And I love your point about let companies sell you. Like, it takes nothing to go on a phone with somebody for 15 to 20 minutes. Like, I run an analytics company. If somebody comes on the phone and asks a question, I've got like one goal tell them if our solution can do it or not. Like, and I will like, even if it's not on the website, even if it's like a weird hack or workaround, like if somebody says, I need analytics for blank, like if we can do it, I will let them know that we can do it because like my goal is to get the sale. And obviously I'm not saying let yourself get sold, but like there you get free advice, free consulting from people who know every single thing about the tool. So if you have a problem, you can literally write up like an RFP and just like one page or like this is the problem and send it out to all the software providers. Like they have ways to route this and ways to like answer your question. So letting people sell you is such a good underused way to get your problems answered. Um, and on the note of getting problems answered, uh, we've got about 10 minutes, and so I want to open it up for questions. Questions specifically around what tools these guys are using, what are their insider tips, what channels, how to measure certain things. We've got a good panel of experts on the brand side, on the, uh, on the tool side, so any, any questions are open for us to discuss. Go ahead. What would you advise someone who's got a new content property that has it's just starting and there's no real analytics to show a brand? Uh, how do you get their attention? Uh, I know it's got to be compelling content. We think it is, of course. But what are the, what are the what kind of tips can you give us to take that property in front of a brand and say, hey, this could be right for you, especially if we think it really matches up for advertising opportunities. Yeah, advertising or branded content possibilities. Um, is it a landing you know, page or what type of content? I'm sorry? Is it like a landing page? Piece it's, of video? Uh, this is a, uh, I, I'm a television producer. I produce documentaries primarily, but I'm working on some web series now. So they have, I'm working on a few web series and we've got three different properties that are specific. Anyway. I'm just trying to understand the goal. So basically just trying to bring in money to fund these well, projects. Well, yeah. But to, to, and to, you know, there's two things we're doing. We're, first of all, we're out creating it, but it's on our own dime, right? It's right. Like, so, but we want to try to put it in front of some brands, maybe to say, hey, look, this could be your content if you want to sponsor it. Gotcha. Yeah. Or, and we're building web pages around it too, and you know, all the other things, social media. Do you want to sponsor it as opposed to being their content? So, so my experience, there's, there's two kinds of brands out there, or there's, there's two scenarios. One is when the brand's looking for a media partner that they can reach a certain set of eyeballs uh, through. You're not in that business right. today. Right. And the other is that they're looking for content partners that are, that are help, who are telling stories that align really well with their stories. Right. In some cases, those brands want the the credit for having helped spread the word or introduce uh, the world, their audience to a specific piece of content. And so the real task is, let, it's more of a sales task, it's finding those brands by looking at, at the landscape of who else is, is uh, you know, what brands are, are investing in, in the kind of thing that you're doing and presenting yourself as, as really a content partner that can help tell their story. Yeah. I would also say show them the opportunity um, and this is something that um, I ran into last year because my husband and a group of friends got together to start the first ever electronic music festival in Cuba last year. So I was helping out on that um, and yeah they were putting themselves in front of brands and they were like you guys work in advertising, you've never worked in music, you don't know anyone, you're going to like one of the most kind of politically sensitive places in um, the Caribbean right now, no, we're not going to give you money. Um, and so what we did was um, look at our two audiences who were uh, Western electronic music fans um, and fans of world music, um, and then looked at the budgets for Cuba, who, who was going to come, that very specific demographic, and said, okay, these are influences, these people have money, they work in um, industries that are useful to you, um, and so when we get these guys, you're going to have 2,000 people who were talking about your brand and who were mentioning your brand at this festival. Um, and so in the end, we got um, Havana Club um, to, to work with us on, on a festival that had never been run before in, in Cuba. Um, 
and he was and a couple of other kind of big um, big music names like um, native instruments who gave us loads of equipment for free. So that was really about showing them the opportunity because the first electronic music festival in Cuba only ever happens once, and, and uh, yeah, that was how we did it. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, it definitely, I completely agree with your point, Josh, like you're either, you have the audience and the brand wants the audience, or you have the ability to create the content. And coming from somebody who's been on the brand side, um, there's often also the aspect of like wanting to look cool. That is a goal, an objective. I mean, when I worked for Walmart, they started, started Walmart Soundtrack, uh, Soundcheck which was their music platform. And it was exactly that. Walmart was trying to look cool in the eyes of consumers who were buying music. And so they worked with, you know, key people and individuals. So, you know, we worked with the record labels because the record, record labels had the, um, the aspect of being able to get the artists and then Walmart had the leverage of selling the CDs or, or back then it was CDs and um, selling music. And the other thing I would highly recommend is um, don't forget the art of bartering. Um, so, you know, uh, you can provide the content, but make sure you're asking the right things out of the brand. So, you know, again, the, their Facebook, their newsletter, whatever that may be, make sure that whatever you're getting in the deal, they're returning in exchange. And so there's that clear bartering system. We're going to provide you with really great branded content that you're going to be able to use on your platforms. But at the same time, I want to make sure that when you post on your platforms, you're tagging us. You're making sure that you're calling us out. We're getting so many posts out of this that we feel like is the equivalent. And don't forget to ask about their brand metrics. So if you create that content, you say, great, out of everything that you're posting and that you're cross-promoting, what, what is that going to get for us in terms of media numbers, in terms of exposure, so that you can use that in your next sort of business opportunity. So don't forget to ask them about that. Yeah, I would just also say and this might be something that you might not want to hear coming from the, the, the TV uh, traditional, sure. but I would say, you know, control your own destiny to an extent and utilize revenue sharing from YouTube and Facebook to drive in and show, you know, revenue and also to show proof of concept. I think, you know, if you don't really have anything right now where you can bring to a brand and say, well, here's what we've done, here's how it performed, and of course, if we partner together, it'll perform even better. If you don't have that, I think it's a harder sell. If you do have that, even if the numbers aren't, you know, through the roof, at least if you've shown something on your own, then when you bring in that brand, it's just going to elevate that. I guess you could show percentage growth over a short period that much. Correct. Yeah, so I think yeah. these are all really good points. Um, I'll add one more. It's also, this isn't really a sales panel, but uh, we saw giant corporations, and the one uh, tactic we use to actually get their attention is there's actually two. We have interns go on LinkedIn and compile the names of every single title at an organization that we want to sell to. Then we use this tool called emailhunter.co to get the email address of those people. You just paste in their name, it gives you their email address. And then this is where the, this is the real gold. We use this tool called reply.io, which connects to our personal inbox and allows us to scalably send e personal emails, not the unsubscribe, you know, opt out, like personal emails from to them. Um, so we customize the name, we customize the title, we customize maybe their company name, and then it can have auto follow-ups, like, hey, just wanted to pin you on this, or hey, uh, you know, about to move forward with another brand, just wanted to check in if you're interested. And so we email personally like two or three hundred of the right customers at once. And yeah, it's a little spammy, but like the goal is obviously to not make your email sound spammy and like if they say they're not interested, like don't keep emailing them and like don't send them 50 emails. But it allows us to scalably hit the right audience and get the conversation going. But uh, all of these texts are obviously good in how you position it. I would also say when I worked at Lionsgate and I got a lot of emails on a daily basis, um, come to the table with a proposal. That first email, if you say, hey, I saw that, and this actually happened, I had a company who um, essentially was an online platform for student jobs, and I had a movie called Get a Job about millennials trying to get a job. And they emailed me and they said, hey, we see that you have this film coming out about getting a job, <laughs> about millennials trying to get a job. We're an online platform for recent grads and students looking for jobs. We wanted to see if we could partner. Having that specific recommendation or that specific, like having the foresight to look into what they have coming up on their calendar, or maybe they just made an announcement that they started a new business venture, um, find that area of opportunity because that's going to just get you one step closer. Because if you think about it on the brand side, we, you know, yeah, we have the name and we have the budget, and then we have a lot of the, the pressure to 
defining ideas or defining the partnerships or whatever that may be. So if you've already taken one step towards that, that area, you're gonna get even closer. Other questions? Anybody? Go ahead. Uh, you mentioned on the analytic numbers, a lot of the demands were, why did, you, why did we get those numbers? How often do you implement some type of like survey and how do you get the people to respond to that survey? So, so rather than you just go and pretend you're the consumer, you actually ask, find a way to ask them. Sometimes you might have to pay them to answer the survey or give them something. But like, do you, is, is that type of survey effective? You can actually do polling on social media. And a lot of times we've done that. I've done that on the, the sort of agency side where a brand literally just wants to ask a question and then we'll set up polling, but make it kind of fun and engaging and try to find a way. So that's like a quick and efficient way to, like for example, we were trying to figure out sort of how teens associate, you know, with like braces or whatever. Like what are some keywords that they feel they gravitate more towards? So we kind of did a quick little poll and gave like three or four sort of keywords and, and had to see what people responded to and use that in our creative moving forward. Yeah, I mean, I'm generally, and I know there's exceptions to this, and I'm generally opposed to any type of structure, polling, or uh, surveys, or focus groups. I just think it clouds the results that you're going to get. And even if you have to pay, I just think that adds a layer of unauthenticity. Yeah, um, yeah Twitter has polling, as she mentioned. Facebook, you can do something similar. And um, I just feel that if you really want to get honest feedback, you have to be honest with the people in terms of your approach. A poll, everyone, I mean, today in 2016, everyone knows what you're trying to do. Like, it's not, you know, maybe 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago that may or may not have worked, but today, like, we kind of started this panel off, it's all about human to human, you know, and so treating people as such will get you human responses that will help you, you know, learn more about the people you're trying to target and ultimately grow your business. Yeah, my, my experience is that uh, those kind of, uh, they can be really useful in looking at relative numbers. So for example, uh, you know, we've done event programs where we'll ask a few survey questions and we can track the answers at one event versus the next event, right? And so you get this like, you just see how it's trending over time. But to your question, I, I haven't found evidence that people are really good at, at understanding why they like or don't like something. Um, I think maybe in conversation you can have that, but in a survey, I wouldn't expect to really get much insight. Yeah. Good. But also, I mean, people under, if you're up front that, if, if you can incentivize them in some way that makes it worth their while, you know, here's five questions we're partnering with, um, I don't know, Sony, and you know, if you answer these five questions, you'll be entered in the head unit, and here's a 20% off coupon. If you're giving them something back for their time, and it's not anything that's kind of, you know, behind anything, and I think people are okay with that. Most people are okay if you acknowledge what it is and you give them something for, for their time. Yeah, I mean, I, I, so I'm a Delta, I have a, own, I have a Delta credit card. I prefer to fly Delta because I also have a Delta credit card and I get Delta points and things like that. And I, I find their customer service to be really great. And they do, they have done emails where they say, we're trying to be better. And so you start that out, you're honest about it. You're like, this is us trying to be better. You're our customer, we're a brand. Like, we're not pretending that we're not. Like, this isn't, we're, you know, this, we're being very honest about the fact that this is solely for the purpose of it and, and growing our, our, you know, making our customer service better. We value you as a consumer, right? This is why we value you. This is how much time it's gonna take you. Like when they don't tell me how long it is, I'm like, I don't know, if they're like, it's gonna take five minutes and out of it, you're gonna get 500, you know, airline points, great, cool, I'll do it. Um, and then being clear about what that feedback is going to provide. So we're doing this because we want to, um, you know, this is a question about, you know, your service at LAX and we're trying to improve, you know, so being very clear and honest. We, we probably have to, uh, to wrap up. So I just want to give um, all of the panelists a quick chance to reintroduce your name, your company, and if any of these guys uh, have interest in contacting you, well, like one or two sentences on what you're the expert in and why they should contact you. Um, so go ahead. <laughs> it's Alan Reed. I'm with Tendi Enthusiast Network, and we are an enthusiast company focusing on automotive and action and adventure sports. And what I do is I put brands with our influencers and with other influencers through custom content creation, seamless integration, and working ways in so that 
we can authentically, in our voice, in our tone for each brand, bring either your brand in front of them in a, in a, in a legitimate, cool way. I don't know if we can make Walmart that cool, but, um, but the point is, so any, any type of content creation, any type of social media um, campaigns, I'd be more than happy to talk to you. My name is Jennifer Lindberg. I'm not in the program because I was a little bit of a last minute addition. Um, I'm Jennifer Lindberg on everything, jenniferlindberg.com, Jennifer Lindberg, Twitter. You can find me on there. Um, like I said, I'm a consultant. Um, I just started this my own sort of venture about um, April. Um, so I um, work with individuals um, on both sort of long term and short term. Um, I'm also um, a consultant and the tried and true measure of literally meeting with you for an hour or two in order to consult with you or, you know, sort of address a goal or objective um, and coming out of that with some real tangible action items and tools and resources and ways to do that. So look me up. Add me on Twitter. <laughs> I'm Josh Hoffman. You can find me at joshhoffman.com, 1-H-J-O-S-H-O-F-F-M-A-N. Uh, dot com, uh, digital marketing consultant, not an expert. You can tell me I am, but I'll never use that word coming out of my own mouth. Don't believe in that. Um, good at what I do, no doubt. Specialized in social media and content marketing. And thanks for stopping by. Awesome. I'm Lauren Subworth. Um, I'm at Hootsuite, senior content strategy manager there. You can find me on Twitter at Lauren Sudworth, and I am the only one in the world, so I won't be hard to find. <laughs> um, I guess for getting in touch with me, um, I love content strategy, so if you want to talk to me about that, I am super keen. Um, and we also have so many resources at Hootsuite, especially um, for kind of people starting out or um, looking to in in increase followers or um, improve their social media strategy. So I am quite happy to um, talk to you, figure out what you need um, and send you some resources because we've got tons of white papers, guides, checklists, that kind of stuff. Awesome. I'm Josh Levine, the company is Rebel Industries. Uh, the podcast is Rebel Radio on iTunes, SoundCloud, and everywhere else, rebelradio.net. Um, I'm a bit of a generalist, so we could, we could kind of talk about anything, but uh, but I probably get most excited about podcasting and content creation. We're actually, I'm actually hosting an event next Tuesday, our first live podcast taping. Uh, it's presented by Honda, and it's right around the corner from here. It's free, and there's free beer and wine and food, in case anyone's interested. Um, come find me after, and, and I'll get you an invite to that. All right. So, and my name's Jesse. Uh, we build uh, SaaS analytics software, influencer analytics software for big brands. So if you're looking to measure and track and search influencers, that's what we do. Uh, everybody give it up for our panelists. <laughs>